In a stunning turn of events, the renowned Danish engineer and inventor Peter Madsen shattered the world's perception of him after he committed a crime. But it wasn't just any crime. It was an act so vile that even the most hardened hearts were left in disbelief. Kim Wall, a top-notch Swedish journalist, boarded the midget submarine UC-3 Nautilus with the intent of interviewing its owner, the Danish entrepreneur, but instead she tragically found herself in the clutches of this monstrous figure. Her story, a chilling saga of an innocent life lost, is one you won't forget. Hold on to your seats as we take you on a journey beneath the surface because what you're about to uncover is far more sinister and disturbing than you can ever imagine. This is the heartbreaking story of Kim Wall. Kim Isabel Frederica Wall, born on March 23, in 1987, was the daughter of Joachim Wall and Ingrid Wall. Together with Tom Wall, who was her only brother and sibling, they were raised in the tight-knit community of the small town of Trelleborg in southern Sweden. Kim Wall pursued her education at esteemed institutions including Paris Sorbonne University, the London School of Economics and Columbia University in New York City. By the age of 30, she had established herself as a freelance journalist of note contributing to prestigious publications such as the New York Times, Vice, Time among other publications. Wall's journalistic endeavors took her to far-flung corners of the globe including Haiti, Uganda and Sri Lanka where she reported on diverse and compelling stories, and just like her other stories she had embarked on yet another journey to cover a captivating story of a man who had garnered interest from media outlets and fellow journalists unaware of what fate had in store for her. Kim had met a man called Ollie Staub who she quickly connected with and they soon entered into a romantic relationship with their love for each other deepening rapidly. They made the decision to move in together and settled in Copenhagen. They had been living in Copenhagen for a while but she was itching for a move away as she wanted to gain as much life experience as she could. While they had been residing in Copenhagen for some time, Kim's yearning for new life experiences grew strong and it wasn't long before the couple jointly decided that Beijing would become their new home, the next chapter in their journey together. In the heart of Copenhagen, while their impending move to Beijing loomed ever closer, Kim stumbled upon the story of Peter Madsen, a man who had crafted his own colossal submarine, the UC-3 Nautilus claiming it to be the world's largest privately built submarine at the time. Kim, with her innate knack for uncovering gripping stories, couldn't resist the allure of Peter's narrative. She reached out hoping to secure an interview that would shed light on this remarkable venture. Initially, Peter agreed, but after many failed attempts to the elusive scheduling of this meeting, it started to test her patience. As the moving date with her partner Ollie drew near, Kim began to accept the possibility that this tantalizing story might slip through her fingers. While she yearned for fresh adventures in Beijing, leaving behind cherished friends in Copenhagen was bittersweet. Kim and Ollie pondered how best to bid farewell to their friends. They decided on a grand dinner party a celebration of their impending journey and a temporary goodbye. But just as Kim was preparing for this farewell soiree, fate intervened. On the very same day of the dinner party on August 10, 2017, a text message lit up her phone. It was Peter offering an unexpected opportunity. He proposed an interview inviting her to board the UC-3 Nautilus where he would answer her questions. Kim turned to Ollie seeking his blessing to seize this incredible chance. Ollie, ever supportive, agreed without hesitation. He assured her that he'd manage the preparations for the evening leaving Kim free to chase this long-sought interview. Kim was thrilled but also felt a flicker of trepidation about descending into the depths of the man-made submarine and wanted Ollie to accompany her. However, 
she reminded herself that she had braved far more daunting challenges in the past and Ollie had to take charge of the preparations. Submarines were also renowned for their safety, well, at least at the time they did, and knowing Peter as a person with formidable engineering skills, he seemed a trustworthy guide. In the eyes of the public, Madsen appeared to be a charismatic renegade, a man whose face had a unique rugged charm, much like a well-worn and intriguing toy doll. His everyday attire consisted of coveralls and sturdy hiking boots, a uniform that hinted at a life less ordinary. As Kim delved into her initial reporting, her knowledge of Madsen extended only as far as the information already circulating in the public domain. Little did she know that the true depths of his private life, a revelation that will come later in this video, would ultimately hold the key to understanding the chilling events that unfolded. Kim saw this as her golden opportunity as it had arrived just six days before their departure for Beijing, which to her was a stroke of incredible timing. She thought that she would now finally unravel the enigma she had been pursuing for months, the story she had once feared might slip away forever. As the clock neared 7 p.m. on that fateful evening, Peter's text message summoned Kim to the dock. She knew her time was limited to only a few hours as a farewell dinner party awaited her later on. An hour rolled by while she explored the depths of the Nautilus and in a moment of whimsy she playfully messaged Ollie reassuring him that she was still very much alive. Peter, always the hospitable host had even provided coffee and cookies. Her final message, I love you, was a warm reminder of her affection to Ollie. Around the same time, a passing boat happened to capture a video that showed Peter and Kim in the upper part of the submarine gazing out into the amazing view. Ollie texted Kim in response but an hour passed without a reply. Ollie considered that perhaps she had just lost signal underwater. Kim was also no stranger to interviews that stretched beyond their scheduled duration that left her behind the expected timeline. This wasn't uncommon in her line of work, but what started gnawing at Ollie's peace was the unsettling silence and the absence of communication from Kim which left him rather uneasy. With growing apprehension, Ollie made another attempt to reach Kim. He desperately hoped that maybe she had encountered unexpected delays or perhaps there were technical glitches with the submarine. The possibility of trouble loomed large casting a shadow over their once promising evening. By 1 a.m. and with still no word from Kim, Ollie's worry had reached a fever pitch. He could no longer rationalize her absence and the creeping dread led him to a grim decision. He placed that pivotal call to the police reporting Kim as missing. A massive search operation sprang into action unfolding under the night sky with helicopters whirring above, private ships scouring the waters and even the Danish Navy joining the desperate hunt. Desperate attempts were made to reach or locate the submarine through calls and underwater sonar but they were met with eerie silence. The darkness had swallowed Kim Wall and the Nautilus, leaving only questions and fear in its wake. The morning of August 11th dawned, and it was only then that distress signals from the Nautilus shattered the stillness. At around 11 a.m., the submarine was seen sinking echoing with Peter's shouts for rescue. A passing boat swiftly rescued him returning him to land where a tense scene unfolded. Waiting anxiously were the police, Kim's concerned friends and her partner Ollie. Word of a missing submarine had by then reached the newsrooms and reporters had rushed to the scene. As Madsen stepped ashore, a reporter asked about his well-being to which he responded with a thumbs up. He claimed that everything was fine except for the tragic loss of his beloved Nautilus due to a malfunctioning ballast tank. However, his nonchalant demeanor raised suspicions among the police.
When questioned about Kim's whereabouts, he casually asserted that he had safely dropped her off on shore, hours before the submarine's sinking, assuring that nobody was harmed. But with Kim missing for nearly 15 agonizing hours, the police were growing increasingly skeptical, suspecting that something sinister lay beneath the surface. The police not buying into Peter's story, they quickly apprehended him. Suspicion loomed heavy as investigators believed Peter may have deliberately flooded the submarine to sink it and this propelled an urgent race to locate the submerged submarine. Miraculously, the Nautilus was swiftly located by a dedicated team and recovered for forensic examination. To the immense relief of Kim's family and friends she was not found inside but this also ignited a haunting question. If she wasn't in the sub, not on shore and hadn't made it back home, then, where was she? Forensic scrutiny of the submarine also yielded a chilling revelation. There was no technical malfunction. The Nautilus had been deliberately abandoned and sent to the depths intentionally. This discovery led to Peter facing preliminary charges of involuntary manslaughter framed as having killed Kim Isabel Frederica Wall in an unknown manner and location, sometime after Thursday at 5 p.m. The grim reality was that he had been the last person seen with Kim as they were the only people on board and there was no credible account of her returning to shore after boarding his submarine. The pieces of this perplexing puzzle were however far from fitting together. As the investigators delved deeper into Peter's actions on that fateful evening and his conduct in the preceding weeks and months, a troubling pattern began to emerge. Their suspicion of him grew with each revelation. Before Peter's rescue and subsequent return to shore, the police made a crucial visit to his wife and to their surprise, she had been completely unaware of any wrongdoing. She disclosed that she had received a text message from Peter earlier that evening, stating that he had taken the Nautilus out but had not mentioned anything about an interview. It was important to note that Peter and his wife were in an open relationship, making it seemingly unnecessary for him to lie about having someone else on board, especially when Kim was there for a work-related purpose. A chilling discovery unfolded on August 21st when a cyclist, traversing the shores of Alma Island, stumbled upon a haunting sight, a washed-up torso not far from where the submarine had sunk. The following day, DNA analysis brought a grim confirmation. The torso belonged to Kim Wall. The presence of 14 puncture wounds strongly suggested that she had been fatally stabbed with a sharp instrument. A startling twist emerged in Madsen's account. He claimed that a hatch had accidentally fallen, fatally striking Kim Wall while she was on board. In a shocking twist, he spun a chilling narrative, asserting that he had climbed out of the submarine before Kim, standing on top of the vessel bearing the weight of the hefty hatch door. In a nightmarish turn of events, he claimed to have lost his balance accidentally releasing the hatch which struck Kim on the head. He described a sickening thud echoing through the chamber and when he finally descended to investigate, he was confronted by a gruesome scene. Kim lay on the floor surrounded by a sprawling pool of blood, her injuries so severe that even the most skilled doctor would have been helpless to save her. In a horrifying decision, he claimed that unable to lift Kim's lifeless body out of the submarine, he resorted to the gruesome act of stabbing her in a desperate attempt to release gases and allow her to sink. The police remained deeply skeptical, unswayed by this grotesque narrative. Over the ensuing weeks, divers combed the same bay area, finding more grisly evidence of her body parts that were tied to pieces of metal, likely from Peter's submarine. Her arms and legs surfaced followed later by the head. Another bag came to light concealing a knife and fragments of Kim's clothing. Even more damning, 
Kim's underwear was discovered in the submarine hidden beneath one of the floor plates in the engine room. Since the investigators finally had the skull in their possession, they could ascertain the validity of Peter's claims of blunt force trauma, but the verdict was clear. No fractures were found on the skull. Peter's second narrative in which the hatch had inadvertently fallen on Kim proved to be just another lie. Faced with these contradictions, Peter was compelled to alter his story once again leaving investigators to yet again confront the dark truth lurking in the depths. This time he claimed he was in a separate part of the submarine when a sudden drop in air pressure filled Kim's section with lethal exhaust fumes, leading to her death from carbon monoxide poisoning. He insisted he attempted to aid her but the compartment remained sealed until after her demise. Peter then asserted that he moved her lifeless body elsewhere and dismembered it to facilitate removal from the submarine. However, this narrative crumbled under scrutiny. Kim's lungs showed no traces of exhaust gases and the puncture wounds on her torso were determined to have occurred around the time of her death. Additionally, Investigators uncovered mutilation and stab wounds in the groin area coupled with small puncture wounds. These findings cast doubt on Peter's claim of releasing gases, suggesting a more sinister and sexually motivated act. While the exact cause of death remained difficult to determine due to the condition of the body after being submerged in water, it was strongly suspected that Kim had either been strangled or her throat had been cut. Police unearthed a trove of deeply disturbing content on his computer including over 40 horrifying clips featuring animated and snuff films showing women subjected to gruesome acts like impalement, hanging and beheading. Further inspection of his hard disks revealed a catalogue of over 100 videos or links to videos that showcased women enduring unspeakable horrors of murder, torture, beheading and sexual assault. His top three search words included throat, girl and pain. Even more spine-chilling, the night before he enticed Kim onto his submarine, Peter had watched a video on his phone titled, young woman in pain as she slowly beheaded with a small knife. In the courtroom, the prosecutor unveiled this horrifying evidence playing clips and displaying links for all to witness. As if this wasn't already horrifying, a haunting testimony emerged. A witness revealed that Peter had invited her onto his submarine shortly after they met by chance months prior. She declined but he resurfaced online on August 8th, just two days before Kim's murder reissuing the invitation. She couldn't shake off the eerie feeling when he reached out to her once more emphasizing that if the roles were reversed and if it had been her submarine, she wouldn't have extended a second invitation to someone who hadn't responded initially. This peculiar persistence raised red flags suggesting a calculated attempt to lure a female victim to his vessel, which bolstered the prosecution's theory of a premeditated attack. Furthermore, disturbing blog posts surfaced on the internet authored by Peter, where he openly discussed violence against women including stabbing and murder. At the trial, a female witness revealed that he had sent her a link to a blog post titled, Heaven and Hell, describing it as an entrance to my head. Chilling excerpts from this blog authored by the 47-year-old inventor were read aloud in court including lines like, If you feel angry with your boss, stick a knife in her back. Why hesitate? She will not be missed by anyone. Bow to your anger. Use your knife. The court also heard of Peter texting another woman mentioning he had a murder plan ready and that she should be tied up on the Nautilus. However, he contended that these were mere jests, particularly with a woman he was in a sexual relationship with and that no reasonable person would believe he intended to carry out such acts. Throughout the trial, DNA evidence further fortified the prosecution's case. While the extent of evidence already seemed overwhelming, 
Traces of Peter's DNA were discovered on Kim's body and Kim's DNA was found inside the submarine. Even upon his rescue from the waters after Kim's disappearance, dried blood around his nose was noticed. Swabs for DNA evidence were collected and promptly matched to be Kim's, deepening the unsettling web of evidence against him. Peter's psychiatric evaluation revealed a man of high intelligence but with concerning psychopathic tendencies marked by a stark absence of empathy or guilt. In a chilling account, one witness recounted a conversation with Peter where he casually described himself as a psychopath but one who was loving. During the trial, Peter admitted to feeling suicidal after Kim's tragic death, asserting he had planned to end his own life after sinking the Nautilus, considering it the right course of action as he didn't want to face the consequences of having a dead body in his submarine. However, it became painfully evident that he held no regard for Kim's life, her legacy or the anguish inflicted upon her family and friends. He had refused to provide any substantial details about the horrifying events of that night leaving Kim's loved ones in agonizing uncertainty, bereft of genuine answers. Peter's trial commenced on March 8, 2018 at the Copenhagen courthouse with the final day being on April 25, 2018. During this trial, he faced three grave charges, murder, indecent handling of a corpse and sexual assault. At the age of 47, Peter Madsen was found guilty of all charges and was sentenced to life imprisonment without any possibility of parole. This was an exceedingly rare punishment for the murder of a single individual in Denmark. However, there are exceptional circumstances where an individual may be considered too dangerous to ever be set free, therefore allowing a lifetime incarceration, and this was the case. Peter's initial years behind bars were far from ordinary. In August 2018, he found himself hospitalized after a brutal assault by an 18-year-old inmate. On September 26, 2018, the Austre Landsret, which is the High Court of Eastern Denmark, upheld his appeal for a revised sentence. In September 2020, Peter admitted to Kim Wall's murder in a Danish documentary titled, The Investigation. On October 20, 2020, Peter made a daring escape from prison using a makeshift pistol-like object to threaten a prison employee that was said to have been a psychologist before fleeing equipped with an object he claimed to be a bomb belt. This triggered a rapid response from the bomb squad and law enforcement, resulting in his capture just 500 meters from the prison, swiftly returning him to custody. In the wake of her tragic passing, Wall's family and friends established the Kim Wall Memorial Fund a tribute aimed at empowering and supporting aspiring female journalists to explore stories of unique cultural significance. In October 2017, Kim received a posthumous nomination for the Pre Europa's Outstanding Achievement Award of Journalist of the Year. A memorial run took place on August 10, 2018, a year after her murder in which people around the world ran or walked a distance in her memory. On November 9, 2018, her parents paid a touching homage by unveiling a book in her memory, a heartfelt tribute that keeps her spirit alive. Kim Wall's enduring story is a testament to her as more than a crime victim as she will always remain a cherished daughter, sister, fiancé, friend and an exceptional journalist whose legacy lives on. If you found the video compelling, drop a like, leave your thoughts in the comments, subscribe to our channel and don't forget to check out our channel for more gripping true crime videos.